Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. In the last part, we got through Tier 1, and now, it's Tomb Time. Good day, mates. Dingo dials the name, and Uka Uka and Cortex gave me orders to bring the crystals to them during the Ice Ages. So, give me the goods, and shove off, or I'll roast you. I want to say Dingo Dial might be the boss you get introduced to the latest in the game in terms of when you first see them in their respective tier. And, uh, yeah, he's a character. Not much else to say beyond that. <laughs> Tomb Time is our first Egypt-themed level, though, and these are probably the most deadly in the game just on the virtue of how many traps there are within. If it's not walls that slam in and bottomless pits, it's oil that see you slick and slide all over the place with crate or uh, blocks of stone that'll fall from above while you're on that trying to kill you, platforms that fall beneath you, or about seven different other things. <laughs> These levels are deadly. Take your time whenever you're in one of them, because otherwise you're probably going to have some problems. And this is where they, this is the first bonus where they really make you remember one very particular thing about Crash 3. Or, or so Crash in general, really. Uh, you bounce higher off of most boxes than you do off of TNT boxes. So, try and actually, t uh, not do what I just did there. Bounce off the box on the top of that stack, rather than trying to bounce off of the TNT crate. Because otherwise, unless you have the ability from the end of World 2... You're not gonna be clearing that jump. Now this level is a little bit odd in the context of the rest of the game because the exclamation point crates, the like the one on screen right now, in most levels they only fill in other boxes. This is the only level where they do something else, namely activate these onk platforms. Also, we have monkeys that throw shit at you. I mean, I mean literal shit. Be careful whenever you're on the oil slicks, by the way, and you see the lab assistants in the distance with the switch, because that's when the blocks of stone are going to start falling from the ceiling. And especially if you don't know they're coming, you're likely to get surprised, and that's either an Aku Aku lost, or more realistically, a life lost. Also, don't step in the step in the, the spotlights. Uh, that shoots arrows out of the side. If you've seen Indiana Jones, you've seen that trap, really. <laughs> But uh, the way the monkeys work is they'll teleport between the various pots in their little sets. And you need to destroy all four pots for the enemy to be counted as defeated. And in which case, you can actually just jump on the monkey for extra wumpa fruit. If you're guessing you need the purple gem in order to continue through that pathway and get all the boxes alongside it, aside from the ones you can break just by doing this, congratulations, you're right. Though notably, this wasn't the purple gem in pathway in development. Uh, originally the purple gem path was going to be in a level in, I forget if it's in tier 4 or 5, I'm leaning towards it being in tier 5. But that's not where it is now, it's over here, so we just have to grit our teeth and move on. Because <laughs> notably, uh, that makes this the first level even through, like, glitch meetings where you can't easily grab every crate on the way through on the first time. Which is gonna become more common moving forward because there's just gonna be more, uh, gem pathways, more out there teleports. Crash 3 from like the mid third on gets a bit silly. <laughs> Still, it could be worse. It could be Wrath of Cortex. Even though I'm, I, I, I'm nicer to the ball levels in that than most, I think. Looking back, a lot of that game could have been solved by just giving Crash more hit points in a lot of the levels, namely the submarine and weird robot from aliens levels. Oh God. Uh, you want to be a bit careful on the oil slicks here, because I feel like your momentum is similar to that in the ice levels of Crash 2, where even if you jump on a platform, your momentum gets carried in a weird way if you were just on the oil and moving. It's uncomfy. Ow. You can see for a second there that I thought I died, because I stood still for longer than three seconds. With that said, we're approaching the end of Tomb Time. It's also one of the later located crystals in a level. Though I do notice they tend to put these more towards the last third of a level anyway, just so y y you feel good, I guess. That jump cut was because I had to check something in my room at the moment. Uh, <laughs> while I was recording because someone walked in. Still, we are missing 
Uh, 17 boxes, I think that was. That's a sizable enough amount. We'll be back for that later, though. Because there is only one level left in Tier 2. It's time for us to head into... I think this is Midnight Run? Yep, and if you can't tell by that portrait, it's time for another Coco stage. This is her second Tiger level. With that said, second verse, same as the first. Though notably, this level and Orient Express are the only levels in the time trial mode that it's impossible to get like a max timer score in because you're always moving forward. <laughs> Otherwise, this is just the first level, but harder and at night. Make sure you're holding your boost button a bit more often to get maybe higher crates or to scoot your way around different obstacles a bit more safely. But also, don't hold it too much because it makes grabbing some boxes next to each other a little bit of a task. <laughs> the, a way, actually, that could be talked about when it comes to playing these levels is to treat it... That was a bad way to miss that box. Almost treat it like you're driving a car. Don't look right where Coco is on screen. Look at what's coming up first and then react to that like you're driving a car. Because I know when I was younger, I had a lot of trouble with these types of levels in all three Crash games. In Crash 1 and 2's case, I feel it's partially due to the limited field of view and the speed. Whereas in this game, I feel they give you such an open view that if you just look ahead, you're generally going to be safer than in anything in Crash 1 and 2. This is equivalent to these levels, rather. Also, again, don't get surprised by the bouncy guys, because that can make you miss boxes and have to reset at a checkpoint, and that's no good. Otherwise, yeah, that's this level. I think it's named after a Robert De Niro movie from late 80s, I think that was. And otherwise, it's the last level of this variety in the game. They, they only have two of them, which is a little weird. Crash 2 and 3 tended to have, I think, two or three levels per variety. Except in the case of, like... Slippery Climb, I think it was. Uh, whatever the name of the climbing level was in Crash 1. With that, though, we're done with Tier 2. It's time for our second boss fight against Dingo Dial. Who, I'll be honest, can either be an easier fight than Tiny Tiger, or just ever so slightly harder due to a certain abuse I might be doing. <clears throat> right. Now you've gone and done it. Them crystals are mine! <laughs> Break out the butter! I'm gonna make toast! Mmm, that sounds delicious about now. Either way, Dingo Dal surrounds himself in three layers of crystals. What he's trying to do here is hit you with fire from above, and eventually he'll charge up a giant flamethrower to destroy the crystals around you to make a path for you to get to him. At that point, you jump into him, and then he destroys all the crystals and resets. With that said, if you slide and then jump while spinning at the same time, you jump higher in Crash 2 and 3, and you can use that just to jump over the crystals in general and completely skip this fight's pattern. You can still get hit, as you saw there, because of that, this fight can either be easier than Tiny Targer, because he won't get much of a chance to attack at all, or just slightly harder, because he has a longer pattern for you to dodge around. Either way, yeah, that's the fight. You thrashed me, mate. No worries, but you'll soon be up against much worse. Don't care, because we get the best power-up in the game, uh, the double jump. To jump twice as high, press X to jump, and then press X again at the top of the jump. With that said, the timing on this is a bit specific, as if you're descending in your jump at all, it won't work, so it needs to be while you're ascending or at the peak of your jump. Still, I like double jumps. They're always good in games. <laughs> That's Tier 2. It's Tier 1, but slightly harder with a few different mechanics thrown in. <laughs> Best way to look at that. And after saving, it's time for us to start off Tier 3 with... I think the next level is Dynamite? Yes, it is. I'm surprised I remember that, to be honest. Well, haven't we gotten far for a pair of fuzzy marsupials? I am Dr. Nefarious Trophy, 
master of time and creator of the very time twister machine you see before you. Uka Uka and Dr. Cortex have sent me to end this little charade, so you won't be leaving my area with the crystals. I swear it. Entropy is a character that will continue to show up through the crash now. He's a character who is a slightly eviler and more competent Cortex, but at the same time, he's still a villain, which means we can beat him, no problem. Now, Dynamite, to start off, and for the most part, plays as just a slightly harder version of the first prehistoric times level. Though the coolest enemy in the game, I feel, is in this stage, this weird proto crash fish. And you can take it out like any other enemy, but it has one of the most interesting death animations to me, where if you touch it, you just vanish because you cause a time paradox. I don't know why, that's just really funny to me. And look there, that's the yellow gem pathway, meaning we can't get every clear gem in this level on the first visit. I don't even think we can get the box gem on our first visit in this stage. But we do have a new mechanic in this stage as well, an egg. That hatches into our own little Yoshi. While you're on the dinosaur, your hitbox is bigger, you move faster, and you break boxes just by touching them. That's it. If you get damaged, you lose the dinosaur. So don't get damaged. You can't touch nitro crates. TNT crates will also still damage you. It's like Yoshi from Mario World in, honestly, one of the most literal senses. <laughs> still, I dig the speed increase because I like moving faster in games. In fact, one of, my fa one of the most satisfying moments in any game ever to me is when you eventually unlock the faster movement option. Just because what felt so big now feels so small and it makes you get things done so much more quickly. It's like in Metroid Prime where I find myself using the boost ball more often than not as a way to move runs because it's slightly faster than walking. Also, in a weird way, these levels always reminded me of the Koala Kong boss fight in Crash 1, namely whenever you have, like, the little lava and stone background, like, back there. Mostly because I think they have similar-looking textures, to be frank. Still, uh, it's cool. Also, something I didn't quite mention in the first level of Tier 2 where we got to really show it off. Generally speaking, the bonus levels will show you the solutions to any of the puzzles if it involves a power-up. Like, if it's not, obviously, if it's like a, a steel rimmed crate, you need the hyper uh, belly flop to do anything. But in the case you need to use it outright to get every box, it'll just show you like this. Or if you need to use the double jump to reach a certain platform, it'll show you similarly with just a panel in the background. It's minor, but I appreciate the help because I can see people forgetting because of how little it's used that the hyper belly flop emits a shockwave that can be used to destroy boxes as well. I often forget that myself, honestly, because I think the levels and the bonuses only use that element of the hyper belly flop like twice. Oh no, more chasing by a Tyrannosaur. That's not a Tyrannosaurus Rex, Kyle. That's a, that, that, that's a Triceratops. Come on, you've seen uh, Lamp Four Time One, Four, Six, and Twelve, I think. <laughs> But we do get one new little fall thrown into the mechanic here. These weird little mudslide waterfall things that speed you up. They're more or less the speed boosters from the polar bear chases in two. Only they are a bit more dangerous because you can actually get so dangerously close to the camera using them that it's harder to tell what's coming up. Still, that's dynamite. We can only get the crystal, but don't worry. We'll be back for everything else later. I actually forget how I paste the LP in terms of backtracking the levels for items. I think I generally do it if, say, we get a color gem at the in between the tiers, if I'm recalling correctly, as to not interrupt the tier we're currently in. But we'll see more of that later. With that it said, it's time for deep trouble. And something I should note uh, in the Insane Trilogy. Uh, like with Crash 1 and 2, they added the ability to switch between Crash and Coco at any point if you wanted to. But there are still levels that are exclusive to each character. For instance, only Crash can access the swimming levels. Whereas I think Coco can only access the Tiger levels. And that's it. With that said, this is just a more complicated version um, under pressure. There's more hazards in the way. They're placed in a much more dickish way, like that mine that if you're rushing, you very well probably will not see coming. 
And there's a lot more cramped spaces, I feel, in this level compared to the first one. But there is one new hazard thrown into the mix. Jetstream fans, if you get caught in that little tornado they whip up, you're dead. Uh, you get sucked into the blades and, uh, well, <laughs> I'm assuming you've all seen the ending to The Incredibles. Because, uh, yeah, that, that. <laughs> There's another movie that did that, wasn't there? No, wait, I think I'm thinking of one of the Alex Ryder books. Because I used to read those back in the day. Uh, I think one actually released relatively recently, but, uh, I got other reading priorities and life priorities. With that said, you definitely want to be a bit careful in this level compared to most, because the hitbox for the jet streams partnered with Crash... Crash himself has uh, shares a little bit of a thing with the submersible in these levels in that he is always moving ever so slightly forward due to how underwater momentum works a little bit. So it's very easy to find yourself accidentally hovering into the hitbox of an enemy or hazard. As well, though, you're going to want to keep in mind your surroundings during this last third or so. As you might notice, there's going to be a crate we can't break, or uh, a lined crate here that we can't do anything with, so we're going to need to backtrack here later. On my first two playthroughs of the level, when I first played the game, I completely missed that and was wondering where the hell I was mix missing boxes. Sometimes, it's the really stupid and simple stuff that you miss. Especially as a kid, in my case. With that said, we're getting pretty close to the normal end of the level, but soon we're gonna have to backtrack. Also, again, make sure you don't lose the submersible, because then you might lose your chance to grab some of the boxes beneath coral, and I, I really do not like that. Alright, here's the point where we need to be very careful, because coming up is the exclamation point block we're gonna need to hit, but it's also where the standard end of the level is, and if you're rushing too far forward, not only will you easily get hit by the nitro crates, but you might accidentally leave the level before you're meaning to, and uh, yeah, I've also done that a couple times. And now I need to backtrack. I'm just gonna jump cut back to the area where we need to head to. It was that lined crate we saw about a minute ago, maybe? Right here. It's now a TNT crate that we can bump into and cause things to work. Now, an interesting thing about this bonus pathway, though, is that I think it's the only bonus pathway in the game that doesn't have a variation of the music that plays. And also notably, I think in some version of the Insane Trilogy, there is a glitch that allows you to get three total gems in this level? Wherein, you come through this section, get the box gem from the end of the level here, as well as the red gem, but then you backtrack to the normal level end and it allows you to get an extra gem. It makes me wonder how the in-game percentage handles that, because uh, the in-game percentage in this game reaches 105% anyway due to some bonus stuff we'll be seeing eventually. But I really can't help but wonder how it handles that extra gem. Does it go up to like 106 or something? Hmm. Also notably, uh, this pathway is mostly for the red gem, but in development, I believe this level had the blue gem instead because almost every single Crash game had the color gems located at a different place earlier on in development. With that said, that's deep trouble. It's another swimming stage. And it's also the last one if my memory serves. So, yay? Don't have to deal with that anymore. Unless I'm just completely forgetting about one, which is realistically possible, uh, given me. But with that, I'm going to need to end this off here. Thank you guys for watching, and in part four, we might be finishing tier three. I'm honestly not sure. See you guys then.